It's very easy to talk about Buddha's way because it's very logical. It's quite simple actually. Generally, the methods that Gautama gave to people were always a question of a few lifetimes. You can clearly see this today. The Buddhists are always talking about this, particularly the Tibetan Buddhists who are the best known Buddhists in the world today <laughs> for whatever political reasons. They're always talking about a few lifetimes of work. So if you have that kind of patience, that you're willing to work for a few lifetimes. Gautama's ways are very efficient, very logical, scientific, step-by-step -step process that one can take because this is a path of awareness. The significance of walking the path of awareness is, there are milestones on the way which tell you you come one mile, two miles, ten miles, it tells you where you are. That is the most important aspect. That is, without too much trust or devotion, you can still grow because you have a method to hang on to. You just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. It clearly shows you that you're progressing. But with Shiva, there is no such guarantee. And he doesn't fix milestones. You don't know whether you're going forward or backward. But you're going somewhere, that's all you know. <laughs> it's like falling into a bottomless pit. That sounds terrifying. I want you to understand this. A bottomless pit is the safest place to fall into. A pit with a bottom is dangerous. <laughs> a bottomless pit, pit is absolutely safe. Your life is done. If you just jump into it, it's done, simply you fall. If you ever do… has anybody done skydiving? Hmm? You did? So, uh, if you have a free fall, then if you do not, do not open your parachute for a few thousand feet, you don't know whether you're going down or going up, nothing, it just feels like you're floating around and it's wonderful. Only when you look down, the damn planet is coming at you at a tremendous speed. <laughs> if this planet is taken off, this is a great experience. Only if you look down, it's just coming at you at tremendous speed, that's the only problem. Falling is… don't understand the falling as a negative thing. Falling is a great thing. Did you ever fall in love? <laughs> Only when you hit the bottom, then it gets bad. <laughs> if you fell into your bottomless pit, then there is no problem. So Shiva is a bottomless pit. His methods are very different. But you cannot limit him that way because with seven different disciples, the seven Sapta Rishis, the celebrated Rishis of the Yore, he taught seven basic ways in which a human being can explore his consciousness. From these seven, in multiples of seven, it went further and one hundred and twelve different ways he explored and he said, this is all. There's a beautiful story. No time for stories <laughs> So, he expounded one hundred and twelve different ways as to how a human being can attain to his peak. 
and these one hundred and twelve are the one hundred and twelve chakras in the body. There are one hundred and fourteen, but two of them are outside the physical body. He left those two and he said, one hundred and twelve different ways of attaining when you're embodied. That means every chakra in the body, every meeting point of the energy system, one particular way of attaining. So he did not leave anything out. So Buddha is a small part of his work. I want you to understand, Gautama himself didn't go simply sit in the forest. The eight years of his sadhana, he spent with various teachers across the country. And the whole spine of this spiritual process, this knowledge, has essentially come from Shiva. Wherever it is, whichever part of the world it is, the basic spiritual process comes from this spine and it's been taken to different parts of the world in so many different forms. It… they look so different because these one hundred and twelve different ways look absolutely different from one another. So what is the difference between Shiva and Buddha is not an appropriate question. Which aspect of Shiva did Buddha explore? He explored the path of awareness, which is one aspect. It's very unidimensional, but the significance of Gautam Buddha is he is very scientific, clinical. He appeals to the logical mind. But he is like… He also sat like this. Many times he was an ascetic, he just sat unmoving. But many times he was a mad, dancing, drunk. He was in all kinds of states because he didn't limit himself to any particular dimension. He just explored every aspect of life. So what you call as Buddha's way is just one aspect of these one hundred and twelve different ways. And so many others have brought so many other aspects but individual ways. Of the seven disciples, of the seven Saptarishis, the one who walked south, south means anything south of Himalayas is south. I'm talking to all the Mumbai people. <laughs> anything south of Himalayas is south. So Agastya walked south and he became particularly active beyond the Vindhya mountains. You know that story about Vindhya mountains bo bowing down to Agastya Muni and he never came back, so you know that story? No, you must learn something about India <laughs> So particularly the Deccan plateau, he spread himself in such a way Every human habitation in Deccan Plateau he touched. Wherever you see, you will hear something about Agastya Mani. And uh, he started this action for rural rejuvenation. He did not leave a single human habitation. He brought spiritual process to everybody's life, the whole population. They say he lived over four thousand years. We don't know how long he lived, but definitely his lifespan was not a normal span of life. It was extraordinarily long. When you just calculate the mileage that he covered, if you had put a speedometer on him and seen how many miles he covered, you could see it's an extraordinary length of time. We don't know whether it's four hundred years or four thousand years, people say it's four thousand but definitely he lived very long and he touched every habitation and made sure a spiritual process became a living reality for them. We are still enjoying his work, I want you to know. The southern part of India is still enjoying his work. A certain, without knowing why, a certain level of settled nature that you see is his work because he brought yoga into 
people's lives without a label, without a format, just like life process. As you wake up in the morning, brush your teeth, cook, eat, all this he made it into a spiritual process and we are still enjoying the benefits of that. Mm. If you look at any spiritual process anywhere on the planet, you will see it is not outside the 112 ways in which Shiva explored this. So comparing Gautama and Shiva is inappropriate. I have great respect for Gautama. He is a great being, no question, his work is phenomenal. He caused a huge spiritual wave which is still on after two thousand five hundred years. But uh, it is not comparable, it is no way comparable. All we can say is Shiva's work contains Gautama's work as a small element. It is less than one percent because out of hundred and twelve, Gautama explored one. And the important thing is he marketed it well and he encouraged thousands of people to take the path, that's his success. But Shiva is a little too inebriated to do marketing. You should do marketing for him. He is… <laughs> he won't do marketing. But still, I have to… generally it's believed this is somewhere forty to sixty thousand years ago that he started his work. But after sixty thousand years or forty thousand years, it is still alive, you can't kill it. Hmm? You still can't kill it, isn't it? By the time I am done with my life, I'm sure I will leave him little more popular than the way he is today. <laughs>